Good morning. Thank you all for uh, for coming. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that there are so many people here. It's uh, it's a great thing. Uh, I am Todd McDermott. Uh, I am a former security analyst. Uh, well, web security application tester thing dude. You know, did that stuff. Before that, I did forensics uh, at UUNet. Um, and some other things in my life. But currently I'm on a new exciting career track which I'm going to talk about this morning. Uh, are, how many of you here are familiar with Cutlass um, before you came to this talk? Some. How many of you had been to a previous Cutlass talk? About the same, okay. <laughs> a lot of overlap there, all right. Um, but most of you are not, so let me give you a brief intro to Cutlass. Uh, it's a project that I've been working on part-time with uh, some other developers uh, for about a year now. Uh, and it's an encrypted peer-to-peer -peer voice file and uh, text chat piece of software, uh, which I think is going to be very important for the future of privacy on the net. Uh, it's BSD licensed, so go swipe it. If you want to make a GPL, feel free to fork it, and, and we can have a little race, and that'll be fun. Uh, and we had three part-time developers who were kind of core, with other people throwing in patches here and there. Uh, and I have gone full-time. Uh, I've been full-time developing for about a month and a half now, and I'm going to talk about uh, that and where I'm going to go with it in a little bit. Uh, by the end of this talk, I hope to answer the following questions. Who is Cutlass intended for? Why can't we do this with other software, what Cutlass is trying to do? Uh, how it works? Uh, what have we done so far? And, and you know, the question that I'm sure is on everybody's mind here is how can we help? Uh, if, of course, if these aren't the questions that you hope to have answered, uh, please ask me questions at any time. Uh, just stick up your hand and, and shout out, uh, unless we come up really tight for time, but I'll let you know. So until I say, you know, just pop in questions, whatever. So <clears throat> Cutlass started uh, because I have a bunch of friends. And uh, these friends are great friends. Uh, this is Paul and Ruby right here. Uh, they're very nice guys. Uh, I've known them, I've known Paul since freaking middle school. Uh, and they'll, they're great guys, they'll kick your ass in Warcraft, they'll kick my ass in Warcraft. They, you guys might kick their ass, but... Uh, but they are not, however, security experts. Uh, they like to chat, they like to send files around, but they don't want to deal with all this crypto stuff. I, however, am a security nut. Uh, I wear my tinfoil hat proudly, and I really want to be able to talk with my friends over an encrypted, secure communications medium. Uh, and right now, the existing crypto tools just aren't cutting it when it comes to talking to my friends who aren't security nuts. Now, I've got some friends who are security nuts, uh, and that's great. Um, but even with my friends who are security nuts, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Simple Nomad and I were having a discussion. And uh, are you guys familiar uh, with Ncovert? His, uh, his covert channels tool, uh, Steg Tunnel. Anyone here familiar with Steg Tunnel? Okay, a couple. Steg Tunnel is a covert channel tool which, hide, which I wrote, uh, which hides information in the TCP sequence numbers and the IP IDs of packets of real communications. That, so you open up a TCP session and you know it, it's HTTP or SSH or what have you, although it's kind of silly running a covert channel over SSH. But you could do it. Uh, the idea is, though, that over any arbitrary TCP connection, you could hide information in the data, and it would look real. It looks like a real connection. Uh, and that's my tool. And his tool looks more like an Nmap scan. Uh, so it's not a real connection, but it's constantly sending out things, and it hides information in the uh, sequence number fields. And so we were having a communication about the pros and cons of our various pieces of software. And we got about 13 emails into this communication before we realized that we both had PGP keys and neither one of us was using them. And this is exactly the kind of communication that you would expect would be prime material for PGP encrypting. And if two tinfoil hat wearing people like Nomad and myself are not PGP encrypting our email by default, what hope do the rest of the world have for us? Now, some people might think, you know, well, that's okay, we've got, uh, you know, security tools, which not all of you are as stupid as I am. Most of you, you know, when you want to use PGP, you remember to use PGP and you can talk to your friends. So why is it a big deal if we make these crypto tools easy to use? Um, I don't know if, how many of you guys were familiar with this particular news story. Can you guys read that? Not the whole story, but just the headline. The Minnesota court uh, takes dim view of encryption. I'll, I'll give you some background. Uh, there was a court case recently 
uh, in Minnesota, just got back from the appellate level, wherein somebody was accused of child pornography. And uh, one of the pieces of evidence that was used against him to establish intent was the fact that he had PGP on his computer. The fact that he could encrypt files. They did not actually even discover any encrypted files which they could not decrypt. Simply the fact that he had this encryption software on his computer was seen as a sign of intent that he might possibly want to conceal information. And this is why it is extremely dangerous to leave crypto only in the hands of the experts. Because if cryptography is not widely used, then encrypted traffic stands out more. People can focus in on it. Uh, and it can actually be used as a sign of badness. I mean, this is the reason why we don't have uh, encrypted blackness. You guys remember the old crypto anonymous cash payments that people were talking about, you know, five, ten years ago? Oh, we will have this crypto utopia, and the government won't be able to tax anything because we'll be sending these payments around in these encrypted systems. It will never happen. It won't happen not because it's technically not possible. It won't happen because if you ever did create a crypto cash network, it's money laundering. The government would forbid you from hooking up to it. Simply, you know, acquiring a connection and transferring money in and out of this system would be seen as breaking the law. It's money laundering. So, right now, we have an opportunity where crypto tools are still legal. Uh, we need to make them widely used. No one ever got busted for having SSH on their computer because SSH is a common tool. Everybody uses SSH. SSH would not be taken as you know, a point of evidence that someone had malicious intent. So we need to make encryption for other types of traffic as ubiquitous as SSH is today. So going back to Cutlass a little bit, uh, I looked at where the parts, of, what, what traffic do I issue on a daily basis that I wanted to make sure were strapped, you know, wrapped in a strong crypto shell. Uh, and I came up with voice over IP, file sharing, file trading, and instant messaging. Email's already pretty well covered. I mean, for a lot of arbitrary TCP traffic, you can tunnel it in SSH, it's not that hard. It's, it's pretty easy to do. But for things like voice over IP, especially, uh, you can't do that. And also, peer-to-peer -peer traffic, I wanted to make sure I covered that as well. Because you know, if I've got this, if I've gone through the trouble of doing my key management once, I'd like to be able to tunnel as much regular traffic over it as I possibly can. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the existing uh, competitors in Mindshare, at least, to Cutlass. Uh, these are the ones that I'm going to cover. Uh, Skype, how many of you here use Skype or have used Skype? Not, actually, that's fewer than I was expecting. Um, Skype, if you're not familiar with it, is a, it's an encrypted, uh, free as in mere voice over IP tool uh, that you can connect and talk with your buddies and, and all is well and good. And the UI actually used to be a lot better than it is. It's, it's getting kind of cluttered up. But it, it used to be really stellar, spectacular. You, you plug it in and it just works. Uh, the problem is, is that it is closed source. And I don't like trusting my data to closed source cryptography because there's been nothing published about the algorithm. There have been a couple of people that have done some reverse engineering on it. But it's not, you don't know what kind of hooks are in there. There's a central server, uh, which isn't used for actual uh, you don't send the traffic through the central server, but you use it for authentication. I don't know how Kalia would come into that. Are you, who here is familiar with Kalia? Okay, Kalia is the US uh, communications, I don't remember the full acronym. It is the law which states that communications providers in the United States must provide easy access to law enforcement authorities to that communications infrastructure. So if uh, you are a phone provider, you must provide an easy way to tap your phone network. Uh, if you are an ISP, they're, they're, they've extended CLIA out to ISPs recently. If you are an ISP, you must provide an easy way for law enforcement to tap into your routers. You know, basically have a clone traffic interface off of your routers so that if they want to say, oh, we've got a warrant for the following IP addresses, all that traffic can go off into a pipe somewhere. Uh, I don't know if Canada has an equivalent, actually. Does anyone know? Is there a Canadian Kalia equivalent? There's one for the phone, but I'm not sure there's one for IP. Okay, so there's one for the phone, but not for internet yet. Um, in the US, for voice over IP, over uh, you know, computer internet protocols, uh, it is required or will be required very shortly uh, that people 
provide easy tap access, so things like Vonage uh, will be subject to CALEA. However, peer-to-peer -peer networks specifically are exempt from CALEA, which is kind of nice, because there is no central server that you could provide that tap at. Uh, so not only is it technically infeasible, it's also legally not required right now. Um, and currently, as a minor technical point, Skype only has a five-way conference max. Oh, and the licensing terms uh, for Skype. You give them permission in advance to install additional components on your computer when you install Skype. Now, there has, they, if you go to their webpage, there's no spyware. Uh, they make a very big deal out of that. But in the future, if Skype were to be bought out by some other company or if they were suddenly to be stricken with the case of the dark side of the force, uh, you could potentially, you've agreed to it in advance. So that's something also that would make me uncomfortable. Uh, waste, who here has used waste? Okay, um, waste is a, uh, it's uh, the guy that developed Nutella developed waste as well. Uh, it's an encrypted uh, file trading system, uh, which he was working for AOL when he released it. He released it under the GPL. And then AOL immediately came down and said, you're not authorized to release that into the GPL. So you have this source code that's out there and it's floating and you can download it. It's, it's not hard to find. Uh, but I'm afraid that at some point some AOL person is going to crack down and say, you know, we never gave uh, Justin the authorization to actually release that. Uh, so I'm, I'm nervous about developing off of that code base. Uh, also, with the existing waste, I know there are efforts for a waste uh, version 2 protocol, but in the existing waste, once you allow someone access to a group to do file trading, there's no way of kicking them out. They have the group key. There, there is a group key, and once someone gets that group key, they have insight to all the group's activities. Uh, and it's also kind of painful. Currently, there are, you know, you can email your key to somebody, and that will get you into the waste network, but it's certainly not automated and clean. Uh, Jabber, how many of you use Jabber? A lot of people. Okay, good. Uh, Jabber is not bad. Uh, it's got strong crypto available, although it is not required, so most regular users are not going to use it, which is unfortunate. Um, although someone could you know, easily create a uh, crypto Jabber. Um, but the voice uh, specs are not very well defined. At least last time I looked at Jabber, there was a voice initiation, you know, you can create an audio channel but what went in there was really up to the user. There was an XML tag and it said, yeah, put something in here and the other side, you know, if you're supporting the same thing. That's not really a spec. It's more of a, you know, oh, well, here's this placeholder for a spec. Jabber itself, um, so I didn't want to, to go based off of Jabber. There was a lot of crud uh, in there that I wanted, that was uh, learning. Uh, some other free voice over IP pro protocols out there. Uh, they're good, they're open source, uh, cross-platform, uh, but pretty much if you ask the developers, you know, what about secure voice over IP? Uh, because H323, SIP, don't have good uh, crypto support in there. The answer comes back, oh, if you want crypto, use IPsec. Well, there's no way my friends are going to sit there and configure IPsec on their system. IPsec is a bear to configure. I mean, it takes me... If I haven't looked at the IPsec manual recently, it'll take me a good 10, 15, 20 minutes to fire up an IPsec tunnel with somebody on the remote side. Go, oh God, you know, what's the key exchange method that I'm using again? That's not the right solution. We can't require our users to set up IPsec tunnels in order to, to use the software properly. Uh, and then there's Tor, uh, which has been getting a lot of press recently. Uh, Tor is a, it gives you anonymity. It's this onion routing, uh, Protocol. It still stands for Tor Onion Router. It's one of the recursive acronyms, uh, and it's got strong crypto and it's cross-platform and it's it's nice, um, except that it is trying to require anonymity. Um, so, anonymity by its very nature, uh, because they're doing this onion routing thing, where every you guys familiar with onion routers? Who's not familiar with onion routers? A lot. Okay, onion routers. Uh, the concept is that if I want to get a packet from point A to point B, but I don't want anyone to know that I'm talking to point B, and I don't necessarily want point B to know who's talking to, who is talking to them, I can send a packet to point C and wrap it in several layers. The layers are the onion. Uh, several layers of encryption. So I send it to point C, and it unwraps the point C crypto layer. And then 
inside their instructions that say, oh, send this to point D. Point D gets it from point C, unwraps it, and it says, oh, send it to point E. And basically, every hop only ever has you know, knowledge about where it came from and where it's going to one hop away. It doesn't have a full view of the path. The problem is, is that if you want good anonymity, you need to make sure that things get mixed up in such a way that if a packet comes into point B and then leaves point B, you don't know necessarily if it's the same packet. Uh, so a lot of the re uh, email remailers, like Mixmaster, uh, will cache these kinds of things. So they'll get you know, five emails in from various points, and then they'll wait and scramble them up, and then send five email emails out, but you don't know which email corresponded to which email in. And so you lose track of who's who and who's really talking to you if you had a top-down view, uh, privileged view of the network. So latency and strength of anonymity are directly correlated. Uh, and most users are not willing to put up with latency. Now Tor actually deals with this by not having much latency at all. They'll just send them through the five hops. So you'll have five times the normal latency, but any privileged network attacker who has a top-down view, a, a three-letter agency, uh, for example, can break that in anonymity. They can just trace the packets as they go along their hops. Um, and so the anonymity isn't that strong, and they know this. Um, they've written that. Um, and it adds additional latency in. Uh, and it's TCP only, and thus you couldn't put voice streams over it anyways. So none of the software packages out there really met my needs. Uh, so I, I decided, you know, well, all right, let's, let's do our own then. Uh, so the things that I try, I'm trying to accomplish with Cutlass, and I'm not there yet on all of it, uh, is I wanted it to be easy enough to use for regular users, not necessarily my grandmother, but you know, my, my college buddies, to be able to pick it up and use it without, uh, without thinking too much. And if I pick up my grandmother along the way, that'd be great too. I'd love to have encrypted communications with grandma. That'd be great. Um, it would. Wouldn't that kick ass? <clears throat> you know, how, how are the begonias doing? Oh, well, you know. And decrypt that, and that, that'd be spectacular. I would love to see that decrypt. Uh, it's got to be cross-platform, uh, because I won't let Linux go without a client. Uh, I, I'd really prefer not to let the BSDs go without a client as well, uh, although I'm having some issues with that, and I've actually talked with some open BSD folks about the problems I'm having with that. But I've got to get Windows, because if I don't get Windows, you, you never get uh, broad adoption. It must be secure by default. Crypto cannot be an option, because if crypto's an option, it won't get turned on. Okay, makes sense. Uh, I didn't want to require a million users in order for this to be actually useful. Uh, I wanted, if you and your four closest friends are the only ones using Cutlass, I want it to be useful for you and your four closest friends. I don't want it to be like some peer-to-peer -peer networks where you need you know, 10,000 users before any good stuff actually shows up. I want this to be a useful tool, even if it's only you and your buddies using it. Uh, I was talking about how anonymity is in Tor, and while anonymity is not a requirement of Cutlass, it sure would be nice if I could extend it to support that kind of thing in the future. Uh, so that's something that I'm trying to leave in the protocol design, where it's not necessarily on by default, but it is there for the real, the people that wear the industrial strength, you know, five layer tin foil hats. Uh, and I also wanted to make it independent of central servers, so there is no one server point of failure that if that goes down, uh, there is no more couplets. Also for Kalia, if you know there's a Kalia requirement, I want there to not be any kind of central server that that can target on. <clears throat> the things that I'm not trying to hit specifically, I'm not trying to be a strong anonymity system because that would be a usability hit, and that directly conflicts with my first my first uh, goal. Uh, I didn't restrict it to existing standard protocols. None of them quite met my requirements. Although uh, DTLS looks like it might be something that we might want to shift into in the future. I'll get into that in the crypto section. Uh, and it didn't require a global namespace. I don't want to require unique NICs, uh, because that means that everybody's got to be fully meshed so that I can tell if there's a conflict. Partitioning is OK. Your key fingerprint is unique enough. They're not going to be collisions, so we don't need that kind of full meshing of directory servers. Um, for the protocol, uh, we picked, it's a single protocol. Every piece of traffic goes over the same UDP packets, uh, which meant that I had to encode my own reliable transport layer. So yeah, I, I re-implemented TCP, which is one of the fundamental cardinal design rules, is thou shalt not re-implement TCP. I did. Um, 
But it's worth it, I think, uh, because it's nice. You can do nat punching uh, once. with You don't need to worry about port forwarding behind nats. You punch a hole out with UDP once, and you can do file trading, and it all just works. Uh, and now that I've spent the, the time and the pain, uh, I've got it working. You know, hey, it, it, I, I'm glad that I did, even though it took a while to do. Um, anyone can be a server. Uh, I mean, this is peer to peer. There are no there are no privileged peers per se. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that when you do use a directory server to meet up, that you had minimal uh, central you had minimal traffic through the, the central server. Uh, how many of you guys use Silk? A couple. Silk is a great protocol. I, I'm glad that IRC is now being wrapped in encrypted form. But that central server, all Silk traffic does go through that central server. And so if the central server becomes owned or what have you, um, yes, point you back. Okay, so the server is not trusted. If you can set it up so that the server is not a trusted failure point, so that's that's good to know. Um, I wanted to make sure that I had that same property, uh, so that if the central server did not get owned, did get owned, uh, the impact would be minimal. Yes, in fact. <laughs> but it doesn't ship like that by default. Um, okay, well, uh, ours will ship like that by default, so that uh, you know, essentially, we're trying to keep things uh, point to point, so that if I send a message, I'll, I'll talk about this when I get into the group uh, communications, but uh, but it will go point to point. And I've only got half an hour left, so I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. Uh, as I mentioned, advantages of having a single protocol is it's easy, once you have punch through NAT once, you don't have to punch through NAT again, you don't have to worry about forwarding TCP ports and the like if you want to do file transfer. Um, we don't have to deal with any ephemeral ports because you can just you know, bind a UDP port and then do send to calls out of that UDP port. We know what our source and destination ports are. We've got full control of it. Uh, and it also means that traffic analysis can't key on the packet type. So we go, oh, this person is doing an audio connection because we see these kinds of packets and this person's transferring files because we see these kinds of packets. Um, now, before I overstep myself, Right now, if you look at Cutlass, it's easy to do traffic analysis because an audio connection looks like 50 packets per second at a fairly decent clip, and they're small packets. And uh, you know, like a reliable transport packet looks different. They're larger packets, and they come in uh, different frequencies. But in the future, remember I said extensible, parano extensible paranoia, uh, I do intend to add padding and chaffing options so that you should be able to have streams that it's hard to do that kind of traffic analysis on. On it, uh, the protocol allows for that. Not coded yet, but it's there. Um, problems were I had to re-implement reliable transport, and while that's done, it still needs some tuning. I'll get into some numbers later on. Uh, and I actually haven't run this on Windows yet. I don't have high-resolution timers on Windows, so I slightly fear what happens when I start running it there. It's probably going to be a little bit chunky and crufty at the beginning, so we're going to have to do some tuning. <clears throat> So getting into the, the actual crypto components, which is what I'm sure you guys are begging to nitpick apart, uh, which is good. I'd like to you know, get this fixed before it goes, undergoes wide deployment. Um, the things that we didn't pick, we didn't pick TLS uh, because it required TCP and we're a UDP-based protocol. Uh, we didn't pick, some people suggested using PGP or SMIME on every packet, uh, and that's pretty inefficient, so we didn't do that. IPsec I've already talked about, uh, and SRTP, uh, is very strongly tied to the, the RTP protocol. So we wanted reliable transport and it looked like an ugly hack in order to add that back into RTP. So we skipped that. So we've got an RSA signed Diffie Hellman exchange. Uh, so we've got that uh, Diffie Hellman key, key pair. We generate four ephemeral uh, AES 256 keys. We use those keys in counter mode. Uh, we've got an initialization vector at the front of each packet and it's large enough that we should be able to avoid collisions even if people are soliciting uh, uh, broadcasts, which it shouldn't be possible to do because in the next protocol iteration, we are going to have replay protection. It's not in there right now. It, the first time through, we figured, oh, we'll do our replay protection up at the higher protocol layers, and we did it right on some layers, and we didn't do it right on other layers. Uh, to the point where we realized, you know what, this is really ugly. So the next revision of the Cutlass protocol will have replay protection built in at the low level crypto layer, but it's not in there right now. 
Um, we've got a SHA-1 HMAC on each packet. I know SHA-1 is busted, but not for HMAC, not yet. Uh, also, the other thing we're going to be doing in the next rev of the couples protocol uh, is going to be uh, pluggable uh, HMAC and uh, front-end authentication components so that you can negotiate up. We will never put any weak ciphers in Cutlass, so there won't ever be any export equivalent cipher or null encryption cipher so that people can negotiate down to something we think this is broken. Yes? Um, it depends on how, I mean, it's, how, the question was, how are we going to uh, do backwards compatibility when our next protocol rev is going to have backwards uh, replay protection and our current protocol does not? Uh, right now, if, if our protocol was done tomorrow, i just say screw backwards compatibility because we don't have an installed base. <laughs> um, so, and, and probably that's going to be the answer for the foreseeable future, because I do anticipate uh, Cutlass not having that big of an install base before we get this protocol out there. So, um, okay, yeah. That's not going to be true forever, because we, we, we do actually have a version number in the protocol field. Um, so in the future, we probably at some point will have to do backwards compatibility, but we're not there yet. So I think at this point, any crypto mistakes that we make we're going to blow away. Um, this is actually uh, an example of the key exchange, uh, how it works. Uh, we've got uh, the, the client generates a nonce uh, and sends a hash of the client nonce and the server RSA uh, key and the client RSA key. Now, that actually has an interesting problem. People are probably wondering, what's the hash of the server RSA key? That's uh, optional. It's, the server can check it. This is so that people necessar won't necessarily be able to scan for Cutlass nodes. Um, if you want to, you could have your server say, I require that the client already have pre-existing knowledge of my server key before I talk to them. Um, which at that point, uh, if that hash did not match, then the, the server would say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just dropping the packet. And so people scanning, looking for Cutlass nodes, wouldn't be able to handshake unless they already knew the server key. Um, now that's optional. As of right now, it's turned off by default, so that hash can be anything, uh, and the server will still respond. This is peer-to-peer. -peer, this is peer-to-peer, -peer, but there's an initiator and an initiate. Uh, I say client and server. Peer A, peer B. The client is the initiator. The server is the initiate. So your client is a server. My client is also a server. So you're sending server key over there. I am sending public keys. I'm sending public keys yeah. back and forth. The one that's Presumably, yes, or it got sent out of band. As I said, that's optional. Um, if your server, it, it, and by default, in, in this mode, you don't care. Uh, so right now, you'll send that hash, it will be wrong because your server key will all be zeros. The server won't check the hash uh, because it doesn't have that kind of authentication checking on. And it will just respond back with its own nonces. And notice that its server key goes in the second packet as well, the, the public key. Anywhere where it says RSA, but that's public key, that's not the, yeah. So, um, so it's not required knowledge. And yes, we are sending public keys back and forth. Uh, and, and we can do checks to make sure, you know, like a la SSH, is this key what I was expecting or is it something new? Uh, and then the initiator client will come back with a uh, Diffie-Hellman element uh, and then a signature using its RSA client key of the Diffie-Hellman uh, element that it sends over to the server side. And then the server side sends back its own Diffie-Hellman uh, goo and a signature of its Diffie-Hellman goo. At, that, at this point, both sides have enough knowledge that they can generate their four session keys. These are ephemeral keys, so we've got perfect forward secrecy. Uh, did, did you guys get enough of that, or do you want to nitpick on it some more? Okay. Uh, so we've got confidentiality, we've got integrity, we've got perfect forward secrecy. If your system gets compromised later on, you've got no knowledge of what those ephemeral keys used to be. Uh, yes, in the back. Was that a question? No. Okay. Server responses are optional, uh, based on whether the client knows the server key or not. Uh, 
And right now you can do RSA key authentication. Eventually we're going to put in some kind of password authentication. So if you only want people that know the certain secret handshake to, to join your channel, uh, you can let those in as well so that you can allow for kind of you know, spreading amongst friends and you don't have to necessarily pass around, you know, hey, Bob, add this client to your whitelist. There's other authentication features further up in the protocol that you can say, you know, I'll allow anyone to connect to me, but I'll only allow these keys to access these files, for example, if you wanted to, you know, only share certain files with certain people. <clears throat> the trust model that we're aiming for is SSH style because that seems to be a good usability uh, thing where if the key changes, uh, so you were expecting a different key than the one you actually got, uh, it will alert you that, hey, this key has changed. Uh, the first time that you connect to Bob, because remember, we're, we don't have a global NIC space here. Anybody can be Bob the NIC. Uh, it's, it's the key, really, which is the primary identifier for people. Um, and so you'll say, hey, you've never talked to this Bob before. Do you want to continue? Okay, yes. Um, but the, the primary identification is, in fact, the fingerprint. Where we're going to take this, right now we are doing this custom crypto protocol. And I realize that custom crypto, we're not doing custom crypto primitives, but protocols are almost as easy to screw up as primitives. Um, so we actually really would appreciate, if anyone is crypto savvy, uh, to please take a look at the, the crypto protocol. We already do know about the replay uh, problem. We are fixing that. Um, but other people, we, we would appreciate uh, people looking at it. Uh, eventually, we would like to shift over to DTLS. That spec isn't complete yet. They're still working on it. But once that does become a standard, we probably will shift over to it. Um, people have said, this has been a, a, a feature request, I would love to be able to integrate my existing trust uh, knowledge of my PGP keychain into this so that I can just use some kind of PGP key off because I already have these existing relationships. We'd like to do that as well. We have no idea how we're going to do it, but it's something we're thinking about. Um, so that's eventually where we would like to be. Uh, getting into uh, the basic packets, um, there's a zillion different packets. Well, not a zillion. There's probably 20 different packet types. Uh, but all of them are wrapped. I mean, we've got the layers within Cutlass. So we've got, this is the, the base packet layer where you've got a nonce, the packet type, uh, the channel identifier. Cutlass has the concept of channels, which is kind of a port equivalent. Uh, the length of the packet. Now, why do we have the length of the packet when we've got a UDP packet and you just get the, the length off the frame? Well, the length is actually encrypted, and so if we wanted to pad the packet out, you would know how long the packet is and the rest would be padding. We've got our data, and then we've got our shuttle on HMAC at the end. Um, and pretty much everything except that nonce and that HMAC is encrypted. And we think that 16 bytes of nonce is enough that we should be able to avoid collisions. Uh, yes? The reason you want to make yourself is to uh, is there a reason we limit ourselves to? It's 256 channels, bi-directional, so it's, it's full duplex, between each peer. So between you and I, we couldn't have more than 256 transports open simultaneously. Uh, that seemed like a reasonable number. It had to be something. Would you really, I mean, we can bump it up to two bytes. <laughs> I, I was sitting there going, how many, how many open channels am I expecting simultaneously? And remember, this is between two peers. It's not, you know. Okay. They're not really port equivalents. They're actually only used in the reliable transport. So if you're, if you're doing a voice chat, it doesn't absorb a channel, for example. So. Okay. Um, yeah, 256. Who would ever need more than 256 channels? That's going to come back and help me, I'm sure. <laughs> Famous quotes. Who needs more than 640 Um Here are some packet types that we've got uh, right now. We've got our key exchange packets. Uh, we've got our liveness packets. We've got audio packets. We've got reliable transport packets. We have connection info packets. Uh, there will be other packets that show up in the future. Um, and each one of those has their own underlying protocol, though most of them are pretty freaking simple, actually. Um, so one of the few packets types that I'm going to go into further depth is actually the reliable transport layer. Um, because I was re-implementing TCP, I figured, eh, well, let's see if there's anything that I could, you know, improve on. And so instead of having a window concept where you've got this one particular buffer and you've got a window and you fill up that window as you go along, Cutlass is based off the idea that you have gaps. And so uh, you figure out how big that buffer is going to be ahead of time. Uh, if you want to send additional 
you know, new packets run, you're going to open up a new transport channel. Uh, but there isn't a stream transport type in Cutlass. It's all, you know, buffers. Uh, so you figure out how big your buffer is going to be. Buffers can either be memory backed or file backed. Uh, and so the client, you, the, the server will, or the sender will send, you know, I've got a file of this size, and the client will come back and say, okay, I've got the gap, and presumably the gap will be from zero to the end at the beginning. And then you will start sending uh, buffers that filled in. Now let's say we lost a packet right here. So we, we had a, a packet that came in from zero to 1,000, and a packet that came in from 2,000 to 3,000, but somehow our 1,000 to 2,000 packet got lost. <clears throat> so the next response back would, would come back and say, oh, I've got two gaps now from 1,000 to 2,000 and 3,000 to 4,500. And so you'd fill in the 1,000 to 2,000. Uh, a, a point about gaps, if you suddenly increase the number of gaps, it actually switches end. So we didn't actually lose that packet from 1,000 to 2,000. It just arrived out of order. When that occurs, though, I've suddenly got more gaps than I used to. It switches ends and starts filling in from the empty gaps on that end. So if you lose packets, it'll switch and fill in, switch and fill in, switch and fill in. That way we don't end up with too many gaps. There's also protections to make sure that if the number of gaps gets too high, uh, you will ignore that and just tell the other side, hey, I've got too many gaps. Go back in and fill in some of these freaking gaps before you start sending me new information. Uh, and that way you avoid memory exhaustion issues because every gap is its own bit of memory uh, and the like. And so then uh, the last request would come in and say, oh, I need the following bytes, 3,500 to 4,000, and it fills in like that. So that's, that's the, the gap model. Uh, how the rate currently goes, uh, requests immediately get one response. So if you get a request, I've got these gaps, you will automatically immediately send the packet back. Uh, so this allows for some kind of ramp up. Every successful request response pair that didn't increase the number of gaps increases the unsolicited packet per second rate. Uh, so you will send packets even if you didn't get an explicit gap request. So this enables you to, to outrun, if you've got a high latency network, you can start sending additional packets uh, so that you speed up that transfer over a high latency network. Um, and if the number of gaps increases, so either you're getting out of order packets or you're dropping packets, you cut back that unsolicited rate and you will only respond to gap requests in the degenerate case. So it's going to be you know, push, act, push, act, push, act. Um, how does it work right now? Uh, it works okay. It could still use some tuning. It's not TCP yet. Um, copying a, a file over a, a local link, uh, it takes 45 seconds for SCP, which is a TCP-based thing, and Cutlass takes 53 seconds. Actually, the, um, it, it's a little CPU intensive, more than I would like at this point. Uh, if you are on a slower machine, you know, like a, a, Soler, a Solaris Spark 20, it actually runs on Solaris right now. Um, on a Spark 20, I was pegging out the CPU at 100%. So that needs a little bit of tuning. Um, how it plays with TCP, right now it's not as aggressive as TCP. Uh, it doesn't increase the rate quite as fast. And so when you're doing a simultaneous copy, uh, we were ending up with 75% of our bandwidth was being used by SCP and 25% being used as Cutlass, which is probably better than the other way around uh, because I don't want Cutlass to get a reputation as a total bandwidth hog. Um, but I would probably like to get it closer to the 50-50 mark. Um, with regards to over the actual internet transfers, I have an IDSL link, so I'm extremely bandwidth limited. I only get 128K pretty much no matter what I'm using. Uh, are there any questions on reliable transport? I got something to that. Okay. Cool. Um, so we're unrestricted by window size. And one of the neat things about the gaps is you can request arbitrary pieces from arbitrary locations. You know, the, the server, server, again, peer, sending peer, will tell you, this is what I've got available, this is the size of the file, but the receiver can request any gap range that he wants, or they want. Uh, and so the receiver can then say, well, from you I want this gap, and from you I want that gap, and from you I want that gap. It turns into BitTorrent very easily. Uh, that's not actually implemented yet, but it's in the protocol, and uh, so ideally that's where I'd like to take it. Uh, currently, with voice, uh, we're using Speaks. Uh, we've got an 8 kilohertz uh, sample rate, uh, which sounds pretty decent. Uh, I've had chats over the internet. Uh, I was going to demo today, uh, but I'm actually having some issues. Uh, apparently, 
the also compatibility layer. I didn't bring the video out for this guy, and the also compatibility layer in the laptop for which I did have video out uh, was blocking. I was opening Dev DSP, uh, you know, also supports an OSS alike, and I was hanging opening Dev DSP, which isn't great. So I've got to write an, a native also plugin, um, which I currently don't have. Um, or if someone else is, you know, also savvy, that'd be great. If someone knows about Windows Sound, uh, I'm going to be diving into that very shortly. Uh, and so if anyone's got any insight into how that stuff works, I really have done pretty much zero research at this point. So any knowledge would be great. <clears throat> so uh, getting onto groups. Um, are anticipated, groups are not actually implemented yet. So we're, we're, we've just entered the transition from it's done to vaporware. Uh, but this is how it's going to be, uh, but it can change. Uh, you can have authenticated or unauthenticated groups. Uh, the point is that groups are a consensus reality. There is a group private key. And ops, when you create a group, you create a public private key pair. And when you give ops to somebody, you are essentially giving them the private key for that group. Uh, remember, we don't have central servers here, so we need a way of, you know, assuring people that yes, yes, I'm authenticated to give people, you know, to tell you who's in the group and who's not. Uh, and when I say consensus reality, I mean, I will tell you here are all the keys and locations of all the group members. When you send a group message, you are responsible for delivering them to all the group members. Uh, so it really is no central server. You're delivering all those, those messages yourself. Um, ideally, I would like to have ops be able to designate additional authorization levels so that you know, some group members would be allowed to, for example, I would tell you this group member is authorized to kick non-ops so you can have your little op wars and, and that would be fine. Because um, that was always my favorite part of our team. Um, and it would be a shame to lose that. So, um, but there are effectively suggested local policies. If somebody, you could easily hack in a Cutlass peer that did not respect, you know, kick messages and say, oh no, I'm sorry, you know, I, I don't trust you, I'm going to keep this person in the group for, for my own purposes. Which you can really do anyway with existing IRC. If you don't trust your group members, there's not a heck of a lot you can do about that. Um, directory servers, actually we're suddenly out of vaporware. We're back into realware. Uh, directory servers. Uh, anyone can be a directory server. We need some way of having people meet. It's a real pain in the ass in order to type people's IP addresses in every time. Um, so you would pick a central meeting place, which you would then connect to and say, please advertise the fact that I exist and that I'm at the following uh, IP and port, and here's my key, and here's my NIC. And people can do searching on NICs. Uh, people can do... Uh, uh, searching based on keys, people can say, you know, oh, is the following key on right now? Where is he connected to him? This is actually in the back end library. It's not in the client yet. Uh, well, it's in the text client. I have a text client and a GTK client. Um, it will not store file directories. If you want to store, if you want to do a file search, the idea is that you will have a group and you will individually ask group members, do you have the following files? This is a, this isn't a global scale peer to peer network. This is a small groups of friends scale peer-to-peer -peer network. So I'm shooting, that's kind of the waste idea as well. Um, in the future, I'd like to have some kind of meshing mechanism, but that's not in the protocol design right now. Um, file servers, the way you do files is, uh, this is also actually, we're in real world, we're not in real world. Uh, you can load, you basically say, I'm going to serve the following files. You don't serve files based off of directory location. So there are no directory traversal problems that we're going to have. You can say, give me a list of all the files that are in the following directory, and it'll spit you back a list of file names and hashes. But when you actually request, you request that hash. Uh, and when you do the list, it's actually searching through its own internal hash table. When you serve a file, it goes through the directory, hashes all those files, adds them to the directory. Uh, and so that seemed like uh, a safer way of, of doing file serving that wouldn't come back to bite me if I screwed it up. So what we've got done so far is we've got the crypto part, we've got the text messaging part, uh, we've got file push, file serving, you can do that. Uh, we've got directory serving, we've got audio, we've got a GTK and a text client. Um, the way that Cutlass is currently structured is there's a backend library and there are clients that connect to that library. Uh, it's it's uh, an asynchronous kind of connection. 
So you can issue the, the library, you, you've got a handle, you issue it commands, I'd like to connect with the following person. Respond, you know, actual events get pushed back to you. Uh, you would register functions as action handlers, we call them. Uh, and as an event comes in, that action handler gets called. Uh, and, and, and that's all asynchronous and, and works pretty well, actually. Uh, if you want documentation, I'm not gonna go into these in depth because I'm running short on time. Uh, but you can look that up, that's in the tarball. Um, what we have left to do is uh, we've still got to do the group management. We've got to integrate the directory and file serving with the GTK client uh, because most people are not going to be using the text client. That's mainly a debugging tool. Um, we've still got to do Windows, Mac OS X, and Pocket PC, and Symbian, and all the other OS ports. Windows is actually almost done. Most of the Cutlass code compiles on Windows. It's portable. Uh, it's the crypto module right now, which is giving us uh, a little bit of heartache because our crypto guy is currently occupied. Uh, searching for jobs and, and the like, but uh, <clears throat> so but Windows is almost done. Uh, I'd also like to be able to do connection forwarding, so that you know if you can't nat punch out, uh, you would be able to, as a last resort, pick a another peer and forward things through them. Uh, and also, I'd like to do a game plugin eventually because game is a popular tool. It'd be nice to have that protocol support in there. Um, so. Right now, I am currently working full-time on Cutlass. We've been working on this since April of last year. Uh, and we've been making some decent progress, uh, but we got to this year's uh, Nauticon, it's a great con down in Ohio, to, to pimp that con as, as well. And uh, we hadn't made a lot of progress since ShamuCon. And I felt that I, it was really time to strike while the iron was hot. You know, the, the window of opportunity for this kind of thing is not going to be open forever. Somebody's going to come out with uh, an open source peer-to-peer -peer voice over IP crypt encrypted tool shortly that works. And I figured, eh, well, might as well be me. So I've got enough savings to, to last me on this for 12 months. Actually, I have a little more savings than that, but that's what I'm comfortable doing with. Um, and so for the next 12 months, I'm working on Cutlass full time. Uh, I've also, I'm selling t-shirts. Uh, so if I can sell t-shirts, then you know, I can keep going past 12 months, hopefully. Uh, I, I read somewhere, uh, I'm, I'm kind of going for the OpenBSD slash webcomic model where the software is free, you know, the comics are free, so buy the swag and, and help support development. Um, and uh, there's also, uh, are you guys familiar with Downhill Battle? Yeah, okay. Downhill Battle is uh, going for a peer-to-peer -peer file trading, encrypted file trading network, uh, which, runs pretty close along to what I'm doing in a, in a game plugin. Uh, those were things I was going for anyway, so I've been talking with those people, and uh, I'm probably currently the closest guy to, to winning that, actually, just from, I, I've been going through the mailing list and seeing who's working on that. I think I've got a good shot, uh, so I'd like to win that bounty uh, as well. So um, hopefully from, from there, I'll be able to continue doing this past 12 months, and, and we can make this a, a really kick-ass tool that's, you know, everybody uses and, and uh, that'd be great. So if you would like to help out, um, you can join the mailing list and because I periodically throw design suggestions out and say, what would be the best way to implement this? Or you know, what do you guys think about the following? Um, so you can join the mailing list at Cutlass, subscribe at synaclabs.net. It's actually an encrypted mailing list. Uh, I've written some encrypted mailing list software. So if you've got a PGP key, when you uh, respond back uh, with the, yes, I really did mean to subscribe to the mailing list, uh, put your PGP key, there's, there's instructions in all this. When you send mail, it'll send you back instructions on how to do it. If you don't want to deal with an encrypted mailing list, a uh, couple of users subscribe is an unencrypted list. Um, or you can just send me an email directly. Uh, if you would like to help develop things, there's a tarball. The tarball's a little old right now because I haven't done testing on all the new stuff to the level that I'm comfortable pushing out a tarball. But the latest stuff you can always check out uh, from Subversion, I've got a uh, anonymous subversion server at sbn.synaclabs.net slash cutlass. Uh, if you would like to, to link the site, uh, you know, more traffic is always a good thing and I, I'd appreciate it. And uh, I've got to buy some uh, swag up here as well. I've got some t-shirts and I've got some stickers. Uh, t-shirts are $20, uh, stickers are a dollar. And thanks to Hugo who's been pimping out the shirt something fierce this morning, uh, I've already sold a ton. So uh, thank you very much Hugo. And also thank you uh, to Corey and Jeff for helping me with the demo, and unfortunately it wasn't 
working out, uh, but thank you very much for, for the help there. Um, and so that's it. If anyone's got any additional questions. How it goes, what's going on? Yes. Correct. Uh, if your target user base is the common user who probably doesn't really understand security that well, do you think it's a good idea to trust those users to make security-based decisions like that? The question is, if I'm targeting the SSH uh, key model, and I actually didn't know where you were going with this question. I, I, I mean, you said, you know, if you've got the SSH model where it pops open a box and says, you've never talked to this guy before, is that okay, yes, no? Um, and I, I figured the question was either going to go, isn't that too much to ask of them? And you know, they're going to be annoyed by the box. Or he actually did go the path of, uh, why are you trusting these stupid users? Because you know, they're going to click the yes box every time, as users often do. Um, yeah, uh, users will make bad choices. Uh, unfortunately, at some point, there's, there's got to be a level of trust for these users. With PGP, with, with um, this kind of model, at least, you have that option of popping up the box, especially the likelihood of somebody intercepting a communication on their first attempt is low. Um, it's possible, but low. And if you do have a man in the middle who does you know, intercept a key, you've got out of band post checks that you can say, and now you know that someone was playing man in the middle on you, which is a valuable piece of information to have. Um, it is not the flawless model of, of, of doing this. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I think it's the least worst model. All the models suck. I think this one just sucks the least. So, is there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate it.